a very warm spring welcome to this Frobel Trust webinar. Uh, my name's Sasha Powell, I'll be chairing the event this evening um, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to our two speakers this evening, um, Dr. Lynn McNair and Carol Sedan. Hi Lynn <laughs> and hi Carol. <laughs> Um, hi. Hi. Uh, Lynn and Carol are joining us uh, from Edinburgh where they work together at Cowgate Under Five Centre and they collaborated on writing the pamphlet uh, that they'll introduce to you tonight. Um, the pamphlet is about nurturing self-regulation in a Frobelian approach to early childhood care and education and it's the ninth in our series of pamphlets that's edited by Dr Jane Reid. Hi everybody and a very warm welcome and you know we got uh, really wonderful numbers uh, for this this um, webinar and I'm I, I'm really delighted about that because this is a, a topic very very close to my my heart so um, it, it's really really lovely to have you all here um, you'll notice like when we we, we 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 spent a long long time thinking about the um, the title of this and you know one thing we were really keen to do is not to use the word behavior really because um, often the word behavior is viewed through a kind of moral lens and um, there are often d dichotomies of good and bad and so right away it, it, it kind of sets it, the whole thing in a, a very different tone than, than what we'd hoped for. And, you know, nurturing or enabling self-regulation. We can look at Sue Robson's work because um, that really helps us understand self-regulation and um, where the child kind of sets out their own goals through reflection and motivation and a kind of interdependent relationship between the social context and the child's self-regulation. And I think that um, Sue's work it, it really helped me understand um, the, this uh, concept. Um, and I love this image, and I hope you do too, um, where a child is making a crispy, because we really feel that this is a great example of self-regulation. So um, when we watch children making a crispy, first of all, certainly at Cowgate, they've got to queue up and they've got to wait very patiently. So they, they kind of monitor and control the process of making this little crispy. And then the child gets their turn and they melt the much desired chocolate um, and then they mix in their, their um, crispies or their cornflakes, uh, which is uh, an exciting little part of it and then they pop it in the little baking case and it goes on a, a cooling tray and but this is the the thing they have to then wait until uh, they go home so we felt that this was the ideal little image for our front cover and um, so that that real fusion of skill and will <laughs> that that children have to um have in order to um uh, get this little crispy before they go home. So this kind of delay of gratification. So we thought it was really a useful um, image for starting. This is what we'll be covering today. Um, we'll be looking at um, Froebel's principles in a moment and then um, throughout we'll be looking at um, various principles in a little bit more depth. But the one thing I wanted to say is that you'll probably find that there's some things that uh, interconnect all the way through this presentation. We might be returning several times to the role of the adult, for example, um, and, and then hopefully at the end we can connect it all in our uh, final thoughts. So, um, Carol and I sat side by side thinking about Froebel's principles in relation to self-regulation. And, you know, we, we both agreed that in all the principles we can see um, self-regulation. So if we think about unity and connectedness as a child becomes like a member of a community, uh, as we all have to do, we all have to kind of regulate our emotions. We have to jostle alongside other people. We have to live alongside other people and we all have to regulate ourselves. So this unity and connectedness is really important. Um, you know, 
in many ways we're kind of obliged to um, consider others and that's a good thing. And autonomous learners, um, Tina Bruce's work is fabulous um, on this um, principle. So, and also when you think about uh, Froebel's freedom with guidance, um, so sensitive adults kind of um, value children's efforts um, and we're there to offer opportunities for reflection, explanation, negotiation. And sometimes, as you all know, we have to adjust the environment in order to um, support the child to be successful. And all of this starts from a position of trust, trusting children to make the right um, choices. When we look at the value of childhood, again, it's about um, respecting children as unique individuals um, at, at this stage. And I suppose adults having realistic expectations of children at, at this particular period in their, this, their lives. The, so the chronological age is not a criterion really for um, dignity and worth. It's just that we need to make sure that um, we are not asking children to do something that they may never have experienced before and have these kind of expectations. Relationships matter um, is, is also very, very important. And if we think about, and Carol's going to go into this in much more depth, but if we think about the, the adults that um, and how they are with children, so we, we need kind of responsive adults, we need them to be flexible, we need them to um, offer um, mutual um, warmth, emotional warmth. We also need to ensure that we're engaging children in um, joint decision making and that, you know, it comes, this, this, um, th these relationships come with a belief that children and adults have equal rights. Also, um, we know, and it's widely understood, that children learn by example. However, um, for Froebel, it was about you know, respecting children and, and not just um, as role models to share a skill or behaviour. Froebel really believed in the importance of um, you know, working with children's emotions and uh, the emotional needs of children. When we think about creativity and the power of symbols, we think about lots of different things in relation to this, this pamphlet on the self-regulation. We think about the importance of having the environment set up in a way that um, supports children and also in a way that takes children's um, ideas seriously. If we think about play and thinking about encouraging children to act thoughtfully, um, and there's opportunities, of course, for children to play uh, in a co cooperative way because, you know, they're, they're often in uh, little groups, in, especially in early learning and childcare settings. And also we see children as diplomatic leads. So we've all um, seen our children find other children, they enlist other children in their play and they they um, lead that, that particular scenario in play. Engaging with nature is really significant in the way that children often find themselves um, in nature. They get the opportunity for contemplative thought, they get space to be, um, and it's a wonderful um, opportunity. And of course, knowledgeable and nurturing educators, the methods that we use um, convey our um, values and beliefs. And it's almost like a starting point for us. And we can imbue children with um, a sense of potency and self-efficacy and, and help children control uh, their worlds and their thoughts. This um, cult Cultivating Emotional Harmony is the title of Cowgate Under Five Centres um, in exchange for a behaviour policy. So it has this different uh, kind of title. And, and this is, um, the, the creation of this was about um, inviting our um, staff, 
to um, input their personal and professional values into this policy. And it's a kind of organic uh, document, which of course they always have to be. But, but right starting here and now, I think it's really important that we say that um, one of the fundamental things about this whole pamphlet is that Froebel helps us understand that we look beyond the act in order to understand the child. And if we think about ourselves as adults, um, we all have to think about um, if, if an adult that we work with suffered a bereavement, we would of course um, make allowances for certain behaviours. And I think that we need to remember um, that sometimes children are behaving in this way due to things that are happening to them. So Froebel helps us with that, looking beyond what we're actually seeing, looking beyond the act. And I think that's really important. He asks us to trust children. So saying this at the very um, early point in this presentation, he accepted that um, mistakes are part of an inevitable part of life and, and also part of exploration. And we'll be sharing some um, examples with you of this. And the other thing when we're thinking about cultivating emotional harmony, it comes through um, a belief that we need to uh, ensure that we, we have this dialogue with children, a real openness to um, chat with children about things that are happening in their life. Um, as you know, again, as a starting point, punishment has no place in a Frobelian world. But through um, a Frobelian approach, we um, honour and individual children, we honour their um, who they are as unique beings, and um, we discuss with them um, a ways to be part of a community, ways to be uh, considerate. And we focus on the, the conditions of the here and now, and we don't need to necessarily go into the past. <laughs> I hope you can see that I, I came outside because I thought that this was a really good place to do a Froebel presentation, but it looks like it might rain and you might have to, I might, you might catch me running um, in soon, but <laughs> I thought I would just try it out. A democratic approach um, is, is really important and if we think about, um, you know, under each human fault lies a good tendency which has been crushed, misunderstood or misled. Bring to light this original good tendency and nourish, foster and train it. What a fantastic uh, quotation. And if we're um, discussing emotions with children, encouraging them to separate uh, impulse from behaviour. We're trusting them to exercise self-direction. We're respecting children for who they are now and not necessarily thinking about who they will be in the future. And we're um, acknowledging that learning requires exploration and that errors are inevitable and starting from this very open kind of democratic way of being. When children are learning rules, like I've heard people say, oh, they need to learn the rules. Um, children then are not enabled to make reasoned judgments. You know, they're just following someone else's judgment. The whole child, um, it, you know, is obviously fundamental in a Frobelian world. And when we think about the child, we think about um, them, them as themselves, as a member of a community, as a member of a, a family, um, which is really key. And, you know, a, a huge part of our work is connecting with parents and, and linking with them and in order to understand them. And, you know, we're... Um, we're seeing children as trustworthy beings, as competent, innately driven to grow, and we're seeing them as a whole being and a whole person with creative dispositions of imagination and open to new ideas and they're curious and explorative and we're seeing them as reflective, 
who have um, who are self-aware and are developing self-control and self-monitoring. We're seeing them as cooperative. Um, I, you know, all of these things are really um, important. But when we think about um, our children can be suffering from um, uh, you know, or experiencing adversity at home or, or in the centre or, you know, so I think we need to take all that into consideration. And this was an example where we, um, you know, Le this Lisa was um, really upset and it was kind of really out of character for her. And we, um, it, when we contacted her parents at home, she, you know, we found that something really serious was happening at home. And, but the parents, in order to make her safe, were um, keeping that from her. And we were seeing this behaviour really change. And, and, you know, the good thing was we were able to work with her parents there and say she needs to know she's totally aware that something's happening. So, you know, we, we can, uh, through dialogue with the child, we, we learn so much. And of course, for Froebel, each child is unique. And again, um, I don't know about you, but I totally love this quote where um, each child is unique and has the power to express himself in his own distinctive way. Each person, each child has a particular gift which will become visible if the circumstances are right and freedom for expression is given. I, I don't know about you, but I just totally love that and the way that we just see children as unique beings. And, you know, we know from um, Tina's work that, you know, if we want children to develop in this way, in this unique way that they will, if they, we want them to have a healthy self-esteem, we celebrate and acknowledge their efforts. We don't necessarily need to praise them, but we do need to point out the efforts they're making and celebrate that. Sorry, I'll just move this. Oh. And this this one, um, we've all uh, seen and experienced children who are feeling overwhelmed. And, you know, children like us, um, like adults, need to learn to regulate their emotions. And they learn to do this. And when they do this, it enables them to resolve conflicts peaceably. Um, we know that emotions and how we understand our emotions nourish our lives. And children can manage their own integrity, um, their, their, own, their own kind of intensity of these emotions. And they can manage their arousal through time and through dialogue with us. Um, the dialogue is what we can do to uh, support children, nourish their well-being, their equilibrium. Children like adults, their, um, their feelings can mount up and, you know, we can, um, but we need to just help them to show them that we understand that they're going through all these emotions as I'm going through every stage of the weather today. <laughs> this little example with Stephen is not one that, I, I, he, Stephen wanted, he was engaged in play in the garden and he often played in the garden, but he, he it was lunchtime and the practitioner was encouraging him to come in for lunch and he kind of didn't want to. He wanted to stay and play. And, um, and I think that this is a great example because this is one where some adults may have made Stephen come in, but actually um, this, this member of staff went in and spoke to other members of staff. And we can't always, we, you know, sometimes the environment's very busy, but you know, the great thing was, um, there was this opportunity to reflect um, and discuss. And this is really good for professional development. This is when we evaluate um, what's happening with children. It's really fabulous. Um, and, you know, there, in here, in this example, there was this kind of autonomy enhancement. And it wasn't a minimization of the practice, uh, nor was it a lazy fair approach. 
it, but it was supporting the child to formulate and realise their own personal goals and interests. And it was self-governing. And, you know, children have to have kind of choice in these routines that sometimes adults make for them. And also there was something wonderful about this and the way that the child was um, self-directed and he accepted the kind of responsibility for his decisions. Um, and, and also he has to have, or in this case it was Stephen and it was a boy, he had to have responsibility or, or understanding of how this decision impacted on other things. And that's okay. That's like all of us, I think. And then connectedness. So um, when we think about uh, connectedness, it can be difficult for children to, it can be di difficult for us to detect sometimes how children feel, certainly inwardly. Sometimes we understand it much more outwardly um, because a child will be behaving in a particular way. Um, but, you know, we can see if a child's upset often and, um, and, and an adult can move in to soothe them. And it's, uh, you know, of course it's important that we acknowledge children's emotions. Um, and, uh, you know, we can use our experiences to help children. You can, you know, I can see that you're sad. And when I'm sad, I sometimes cry. Or, um, you know, we can help them. And it, it is so wonderful that they, when they know that their emotions are acknowledged, well, they sometimes don't need to show it anymore because you've already explained to them that you understand it. You've shown how that you understand how they feel. And this narrating actions and feelings is really a uh, key as well. So children, and again, Tina Bruce's work really helps us here, where children are developing an understanding of their emotions and they're kind of progressing um, the development of language and social skills to govern how they behave um, when they're emotionally aroused. And Sue's work helps us understand that through this progression, they're developing ways to self-regulate. And, and adults, again, are, we, they need adults who are dependable. They need adults that are responsive and um, empathetic, not punitive adults. And they need dialogue that um, supports them to uh, develop this emotional um, balance. And, and over time, the children develop this um, ability to kind of manage their emotions. And we've seen that in the children that we work with. And, and they start developing it almost independently, which is surely um, one of our, our goals. So the path to self-regulation um, involves a lot of different things. And this quote from Frobel, wisdom is shown when Edu one educates oneself and others in the freedom of self-awareness. And also, sorry, I'm going to also say this one because I love it. I wanted to educate children to be, to be free to think and take action for themselves. And you know, I love that, that causing thought that, that emerges all the way through um, Froebel's work. But what do children really need to be self-regulating? Well, they need to belong, don't they? They need um, love, they need joy, they need self-fulfillment. They need to be able to um, get the opportunities for mastery uh, and choice and connectedness and empathy and acceptance. And we see all that um, in, in our children. And again, coming back to the adult, where we need responsive uh, adults who are nurturing, who offer empathy and guidance and authentic feedback because children understand when feedback is not authentic. The objective is um, not to, for us as adults to try to change the child's behaviour, um, but it's to cause thought and Tina does excellent work on, on that. We know that children need space for thinking, to, to, to think through, to, um, in order to cause thought, they need the space to um, enable them to do that. And, 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 you know, rather than jumping in, we need to stand back 
and give children that time that, that's really needed to think through what they're doing and why they're doing it. Goodness knows we need that time. Sometimes we're unsure as adults about um, that, that kind of space and time. So we do need to sit back and not always jump in, but give children opportunities, maybe move in and maybe make some suggestions and maybe stand back. But we'll know our children really well in order to do that. Co-regulation, um, working together uh, with our children uh, is really key and, and in order that we're totally kind of sensitive um, to uh, what's happening. And um, interestingly enough, we were speaking um, before this webinar started with Sasha. And one of the things that I think is really important and I, a really good space where children need to be is that we need to think about um, giving practitioners the same uh, kind of quality of treatment that we expect them to offer our children. And I know that you'll maybe think, where's Lynn going with that? But I think that that is really important that our practitioners need to be loved. And I think our children know when um, they've got practitioners around them that care for them and love them. This is, this is almost kind of one of my favourite things, but um, uh, anybody that's read my thesis will know that I, this is where my thesis ended up about behaviour management. And, you know, one of the things I want to say really strongly, and this is definitely um, a, a Frobelian um, a, a whole Frobelian aim, behaviour management strategies do not lead children to self-regulate. So we need to think about that. Children do need an independent um, sense of right and wrong. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But they do not need a reward in order to get there. And again, I, I'm sorry, I'm overusing Tina, but um, Tina's work is great on this. Um, if you um, we want our children, I hope, to behave thoughtfully um, because it's the right thing to do. It's, it's good for the civic world. Um, so that's what we are hoping will happen. So we want children to do that without a reward so that it's an intrinsically motivated thing. But, you know, sometimes we, if we, we give children rewards, it distracts them from um, what they're doing, from the civic world that, that, of what's happening. Uh, um, one of my colleagues who, whose children um, attended Cowgate uh, did go to um, primary school and he was really surprised when she started, uh, when his daughter st stopped wanting to help out at home and things because she kind of was looking for what she was going to get from it. Um, so isn't that interesting? Um, often adults will um, ask children or reward children for doing things because it's something they want children to do. So um, really um, important. Now I'm going to pass on to my colleague, um, Carol Sardan. Lynn, that was amazing. You're a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very inspiring, really amazing. Um, so the section that I'm going to do is the role of the adult, um, freedom with guidance, and just opening up here with um, the, the, this, it's not a quote, but um, according to Froebel, the child will flourish if they're given the opportunity for freedom of expression. Um, so the risk is if we squash children's freedom and we don't allow them to express themselves to create um, and try things out is that when they get to adults that they won't use their freedom so wisely um, and I think that's an absolutely fundamental um, thought. Um, now as uh, Lynn has talked about what we don't suggest is this kind of lassie fair approach where we're letting children um, do anything. We're trying to encourage independent thought um, and get to really know themselves as people. Something that we use at <coughs> Cowgate a lot is the concept of pause and we use that kind of twofold. Um, first as educators ourselves, instead of kind of trying to jump in, I will say to myself, ah, 
I'm just going to take a little pause and see if the children can resolve things themselves. And very often they can. Um, and the second way that we would use it is um, when we're talking to the children. So, for example, today I was in the block room and a, an amazing construction was getting built and it was getting higher and higher and more and more rickety. And rather than me saying, ah, stop, something is going to fall, someone's going to get hurt. Um, I kind of just stood back and I was like, oh, maybe we should just pause here for a little minute. Um, and what we're trying to do by doing that is for the children to kind of step back and take a look. What we're not trying to do is have like preconceived ideas of what we want them to do. We really want them to come up with their own creative solutions. So I might have thought, hmm, maybe we need to take some blocks down. But what they came up with instead was, oh, I think we need to create a barrier so that no one gets hurt. And that's that's ideal. We, we, we don't want to kind of make implications. We really want them to be coming up with their own ideas because that's going to stand them in really good stead as they go through um, adulthood. So um, I think we're on the next slide already. So I'll just skip on to this. Um, so this is balancing support with acceptance, freedom with guidance. So Lynn's talked about this already, the idea that um, Froebel stressed the means, um, the value of reflection as a means of learning from experience and developing mindful and effective practice. I have to say, I think the, the most reflective practitioners are our best ones. Um, and this is a really nice example. I think the person that uh, brought this to me is actually on the call, so she will she will recall it well. Um, so picture the scene. You've um, grown beautiful little snowdrops at home and um, you've nurtured them, you've cared for them and you know the children have been really talking about spring a lot and you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to bring this in and so show the children. You bring it in, you present it on a table um, and then you go off and do something else like literally 10 or 15 minutes later you come in and the snowdrops have been snipped and they're scattered all over the floor. You can imagine. <laughs> The upset um, and you you might want to kind of chase down the culprit and find out who was it that did this and have a good good strong talking to them um, but what happened instead was luckily maybe the person couldn't find the child um, and she sat and she chatted to her colleagues and they chatted about you know why would they do something like this is it okay to do this? Um, how do we balance the need for the individual curiosity with um, the community? And just that time to sit and chat and not necessarily come to any massive conclusions um, apart from, we'll never really know why the child did this, but it is an opportunity to have a little chat with a child, but be very, very careful not to bring shame or judgment. And so that's what she did. She had a little chat with a child and they shared the love of flowers um, and they um, found out oh, that she just wanted to see how it growed. Um, and it was just like a really nice way to reflect together um, with the child um, about what had happened. Um, and I think that's it for that page. Lynn, if you're there, can you flip me onto the next page? Ah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I am um, according to Froebel, there's no need for adults to jump in and try and offer solutions and quick fixes. So um, he encourages educators to set an example and role model ways of peaceful resolution. Um, and I've got another really nice example of when this happened, maybe a couple of weeks, I think the person is also on the call. Um, and I love this example. So. The children were out um, recycling, as we often do, down at the grass market, and they were trundling along with a big trolley, um, and they were going up the hill, and there was a few tired legs, and some children wanted to clamber in, and so they did, and then they got to the top, and then there were some more tired legs, oh, and one of the children really, really, really wanted to get in, but the other children really, really, really didn't want to get out. And so the practitioner engaged in this beautiful, gentle dialogue. Oh, uh, it looks like Alex is getting upset that he's not getting a turn in the trolley. 
but you don't look like you're ready to come out. And it took, they were there for a really long time, toing and froing, toing and froing. Now the temptation might have been to say, right, that's it. We're swapping places, you've had your turn um, and kind of taking children out. But that's not what happened. Um, one of the children said, do you know what? I think we need to walk and talk. And that's what they did. They trundled back up the road to Cowgate. Um, and the next day, the child that didn't get in did get to go into the trolley and have their turn. But what was really important, I think really important lesson here is that um, the practitioner didn't demand a resolution, didn't um, kind of force the issue. But what did happen was seeds were planted they've talked about fairness, they've talked about sharing, um, and what we ultimately want is for children to come to that themselves naturally, not an adult dictating. So maybe they're not the next time, not the next time, not the time after that, even the time after that, but in the future, they will become kind of intrinsically, genuinely ready to share, um, rather than having a kind of adult voice telling them what to do. Uh, so yeah, I think we've kind of covered some, most of that and I can see we're kind of pushing on for time. So Lynn, if you wouldn't mind moving me on. Um, another example, I think the person might be on the call. So this has been a very collaborative effort um, with this pamphlet. So thank you everybody. Um, so this is on reflecting on what has gone wrong. <coughs> and you know yourself, um, often things go wrong. Um, and I think this is a really lovely, honest example um, from one of our practitioners. So they were out in the garden, kind of sat, sitting back, watching what was going on and witnessed um, another child hitting a, um, someone that was happily playing. Um, and the child got very upset. They went over to console the child um, and the child once soothed said, oh, I want to speak to the other child about what happened. Um, and they went over and the practitioner reflects now that they went over probably looking angry, the body language was suggesting, I'm really not happy with what you just did. Um, and as a result, the child was very resistant to any dialogue or conversation and in fact started some name calling and then kind of ran off and probably was left with feelings of shame and guilt and badness. And that's what we have to be really cautious about doing is that we don't, um, you know, we, the child does make mistakes, we make mistakes, but together um, we have dialogue um, and we have compassion and we have understanding for each other. Um, and yeah, it's just really important to be kind to ourselves because, you know, it's a tough emotional job and it's really important that we apply forgiveness and understanding as we all live and learn together. Uh, okay, next page, Lynn, thank you. Um, yeah, so I've kind of um, talked about that first section there. Um, now, this is something that we've probably all been here as well. Um, so it was actually me in this instance. Um, we, I was in the, the workroom and there was amazing creative explosion happening. Children were adding things to the water tray. There was paint, there was chalk, there was wool going in. And I was kind of marveling with them at the swirls. Um, and then I started to think, uh, maybe this is getting a little bit out of hand and someone's gonna come in and think that I have lost control of the situation and I'm gonna be judged and then I'm gonna feel bad. And then I went back to, oh, but look, they're having so much fun. There's so much freedom and expression and isn't it wonderful? And I was kind of fluctuating between these moods and that is perfectly normal and acceptable. Um, and at one point, um, one of the children took a massive tub um, of paint and was about to tip it all in and very gently, um, I went over and I was like, hmm, that looks like a really large amount of paint that's going in there. And they kind of turned and looked at me um, and were like, ah, 
still kind of quite tempted to pour the whole lot in and I was like mm, I'm just wondering about you know how much resources we're using and um, how when someone else comes to paint what's going to happen so I mean I would really try and avoid putting ideas in children's heads and you're really trying to um, get them to come up with their own solutions but it is sometimes okay um, to to kind of highlight what you know the, the impact of the community um, and yeah I think that's all I've got to say on that page actually and now I think I'm going to hand back over to Lynn who will I'm sure beautifully unify our presentation and <laughs> she's back inside <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry everyone I'm back inside <laughs> uh, so, um, really what I want to do is just kind of sum up these final points before going to questions but uh, you know I, I hope that what we've shown is that um, the importance of guidance rather than controlling children is is very Frobelian and also um, thinking about never jumping in, thinking about the act before we you, you make any uh, decisions about it. What we really do want is children to grow up and learn with confidence and adventure uh, and a sense of justice and, uh, and the courage to act on that sense of justice. We also know that um, there's um, transient discomfort for children. Um, we've, we've shown that in some of our examples where sometimes illness and fatigue are impacting on children. We need to look beyond that and try and understand that and understand that the child is, you know, when you know your children really well, you can tell if there's something happening. We're looking for solutions, not culprits in this, in this, um, this work. And we're also thinking about um, the ways that, you know, we've said and um, time and time again, strict discipline and censure have got no place in a Frobelian world. And children self um, regulation leads children to a greater um, understanding of themselves and how they cooperate as members of a community. And, you know, you could equally apply that to um, adults. And rewards, um, you know, reduce intrinsic um, motivation. And if we think about, um, you know, the, the real key importance, and, and I think that's been one of the, the golden threads throughout this presentation, both when I'm out in the snow and, um, and now that I'm inside and Carol's presentation, the importance of dialogue and the importance of um, having these conversations with um, children in a non-blaming, non-judgmental way neither of the child nor of yourself we're all human and we're all fallible and we'll all make mistakes and i think that um that's where i kind of want to to leave that and say thank you very much for listening to carol and i we had great fun putting this together and i know that um we're here to answer any questions Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Carol. What an amazing presentation and, of course, a wonderful pamphlet. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. It was really lovely to listen to you talking about it. It's somewhat different when you hear the authors talk about their work rather than uh, reading it for yourself. Um, there have been some questions and um, a lot of them are about rules. And while you were talking, I was, I was thinking how much what you said demonstrates that nothing happens in isolation, nothing that children do happens in isolation and how everything is connected. And I think Carol, your example of uh, the snowdrops really brought that home about the need for practitioners to be conscious of their own uh, self-regulation and how dialoguing with others is a form of co-regulation for adults in those mm -hmm. stressful in, uh, situations. The questions about rules, um, which, which were numerous really, um, revolve around who makes decisions, I think, um, and how decisions can be reached about what is and isn't acceptable and, and where the power lies yeah. in that decision-making <laughs> process, if that makes sense. So could you just talk a little bit more 
about um, how you deal with those difficult situations where you've got to regulate your own feelings. Ah, the snowdrops have been snipped. Um, and, and, and create a kind of community of decision making. Carol, you or me? Yeah, I don't mind. Okay. I mean, trust trust comes to mind for me is trusting the children. Uh, I mean, these things happen all the time, like literally all the time. And like, we just always trust the children to come up with the, like, we just don't have any rules. That, you know, we, we just trust the children. And sometimes it takes a while to get to, um, to some sort of solution, but, um, you know, Froebel would have asked us to trust the children um, and just be patient with them. Lynn, I, I don't know if that's something. Well, yeah, the one thing I was going to say is, um, and I really like the fact that people have raised this, um, the power, we, it, it, certainly in our workplace, and I think when I, I, I look at Froebel's work and I look at Froebel's writings, I think that um, the, the adult who holds all this power, and, and you know, we do as adults have, you know, the, just because we're adults, we seem to have this power. But certainly we, we're we always trying to break it down and try and um, negotiate with children and have this dialogue with children rather than saying, well, that's the way it is. Or we, we go, oh, well, well, what can we do about this? And thinking about that together rather than thinking it's the... Um, and I mean, the one thing that I love about um, certainly our workplace is that um, we talk about this flatter hierarchy where, um, you know, Carol wouldn't think twice about challenging me and we, we, we have lovely debates with each other and we do, we try really hard to ensure that that's how we are with our children. Now, I know that people will maybe think that how you know where do how do you get to that because adults make these decisions but we we do sort of make ourselves stop think were children invite included in decision making this is greatly impacting on their lives um so so that kind of thing and the one thing that we found is that when children trust us as well um we can together we can make those decisions and you know the wonderful thing is the, the decisions the children make tend to work yeah. and they work better than some of the adults oh. that have um, known making decisions. So, and I mean, I, I know that we should be surprised at that, but um, time and time again, they, they prove themselves to us um, making those decisions. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. example about um, the, the snowdrops, that threw us all because we can totally understand that um, you know, you've grown these little um, snowdrops from bulbs and it's taken like a long time. And then I think they were only in the nursery about 15 minutes. But this was a, a child, when we looked beyond it, who was actually a very creative child. She loved flowers, and but she also loved cutting. So she actually combined her two interests together. And, 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 you know, when we looked beyond it and understood where she was going, it, it, it was really great and it was a, a fantastic exercise for the team. Mm. Um, absolutely. And, 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 and someone's just commented in the, in the chat that the, the, the <laughs> I love the expression, the snowdrop massacre is a perfect example of reflecting what, on one's own self-regulation. Um, and... Um, I think thinking about uh, Peter Moss's ex expression that um, early childhood uh, centres can be sites of democratic practice um, makes me think about the fact that there are lots of pressing rules and regulations and decision makers who aren't within the setting. And someone asked about how you deal with um, perhaps parents who are resistant to the approach and who may not feel that they are on on the same page with you. Yeah, great. Carol, will I come in then if you've got uh -huh. something? Yeah. So it's an excellent question because we definitely do not suit everybody. 
um, and and that I'll have to put that out there. We we try really hard, like at our home visits, for example, to um, explain our ethos. We leave a little pack of information. We we explain things that we will not do. Um, you know, for example, if a parent doesn't want a child to go outside, we'll say, well, that wouldn't be possible. All our doors are open. Um, and uh, so that kind of thing. And we, um, but we do have, um, like some parents that, that come in and they've agreed with kind of our way of being. And then they, um, they, they want to kind of change it once they've started. But we, we say, and, and we're quite strong on this and quite confident, we'll say, maybe we're not for you. You know, we'll try and work with them. And, you know, Frobo's absolutely right. It, you've got nothing if you can't work with your parents. But we've also seen parents that we um, that have been totally the other way or, or totally wrapping children in cotton wool and not wanting children to experience things because they're worried about their safety um, but we've absolutely seen that flip round when you've worked when we've worked with them so the, but we've seen two sides I mean we we've said you know there's some parents that we've said we might not be right for you you know because we were not mm -hmm. in this practice mm -hmm. um, and and you know we do we that does that does happen so um, I, I think that I have to admit to that, but we, we do stick with our, our principles. Um, mm. And even when we were preparing for this pamphlet, um, a, a parent thought it was kind of like a really lazy, fair approach to um, to working with children because we were sharing the pamphlet as we were going along. And, and so there was a kind, and this was a reasonably new parent, so there was a kind of, um, lack of understanding so we had to help that that family understand carol i don't know if you yeah. want yeah I, uh, I mean I, I think i agree that we i mean we have such a good team with such a strong ethos that you know it'd be really hard for us to deviate from that um like we find real strength as a team uh, and, and yeah we really try and work along with parents and i think when they read are incredibly rich lived stories where it's so clear that we really understand each individual child. They kind of come on that journey and we're very open and, you know, people spend time in the garden and we can really explain our thinking. And what is really interesting is that a lot of people that have, ha have been parents um, and have had children at Cowgate go on, like they're like super fans of Cowgate, mm -hmm. like they become converted, like me, for example, um, because, you know, this way of thinking, this Frobelian ethos, you know, it's just, it's such a great tool as a parent as well. Like I've really used it as a parent, this Frobelian ethos. And, you know, I just think, you know, what a great way to be in a community, so. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, it, it leads me really to another question. We're, we're a little, well, about 10 minutes over time. So I'm going to ask you two more questions. Uh, we, we may not have time for you to answer both of them. Um, uh, the first one is really about whether, or how you deal with the fact that Cowgate has this particular ethos and approach that is quite distinctive. Um, as each setting is distinctive. And um, some, some um, of our delegates are asking, well, what happens when children go out in the big wide world and the, rule, the world about rules is not the same? What happens then where they're experiencing a very different kind of approach? Can I just uh, chip in there and I'll speak really quickly and pass you on to Carl. The one great thing is We've got evidence. Um, my PhD thesis followed 16 children to four different schools, and, and each of the schools had different kinds of rules, and, um, and you know, maybe they needed to have them. And all the children seemed to kind of adapt to the, the rules, but they also challenged them. And nearly all the children that, that had come from our setting that had gone into the four schools, um, we're all on things like the 
pupil um, um, committee and things, so they were ready to voice their their um, views and finding channels to do that. So I would like to think that's because they were listened to and responded to mm. in um, our setting. Mm. And their voice was valued. Um, the, sorry to cut you short. Um, I'm, I'm going to make this the very last question because we're, we are short of time. Um, we've had um, a few people asking, how can um, your approach be applied in a context where, or, or adapted in a context where children have very severe and complex needs, maybe non-verbal, so they can't engage in the same kind of way in dialogue, or though of course they may have other ways of, of conveying their thoughts and feelings without being verbal. I'm happy to, because we, we actually have children like that um, in, in Cowgate um, and um, we had the educate. There was a, a, a children's planning meeting today, um, and overwhelmingly, so they had been in a previous setting, but not a Fabian setting, um, and they have come to us, and they've been with us a really short time, and the educational psychologist said to us. I could cry with happiness because she sees how this child is given freedom and that things are not taken out of her hand and that, you know, like we will adapt our practice to suit the child. So it's that still we're keeping this really individual approach. Um, and so it's just really heartwarming to, you know, see that we have made a difference and they're talking about, you know, maybe being able to defer and stay with us because like it's you know it's very sadly she's on a kind of downward slope and her her um her disease is going to debilitate her but they're saying that they're actually seeing um improvements in areas and you know that that's the fabulian ethos coming through definitely thank you carol I wish we could talk for longer. There have been yes. so many questions, which I will share with, with you um, after the webinar, if I may. And I'm so sorry that we've not had a chance to address or talk about all of them. It's been the most wonderful conversation uh, following the, the fantastic presentation. Thank you both very much indeed for sharing your thoughts with us this evening. And thank you everyone for attending too. I just want to give a very quick apology for the fact that this webinar was set up before the clocks changed. So if there was any confusion about whether it started at seven o'clock or six o'clock or eight o'clock, um, that's the reason why um, we would have had to have said we were in the, Azor the Azores or somewhere like that to have got it to have been the right time before the clocks changed. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for joining us. And um, as I said, the recording will be available very soon. And do download the pamphlet if you haven't already done so. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.